Now are now we are live air with all of our beautiful attendees? Yes, we are. All right, attendees, welcome to the second installment of our ESFL Hall webinar series. This one is going to be quite a treat. This is a very special speak, a speaker who is near and dear to every SFLer, and he's boss. So he's going to be giving us a great speech, and this is going to be from his text in the book Why Liberty. Why Liberty has been shipped out across of Europe, and uh, you shall be getting it in your local student groups very soon if you did file a request. And I would like to introduce at this time the Vice President of Students for Liberty International. His name is Mr. Clark Rupert. He's broadcasting from Washington, D.C., here to present his idea on radical centrism. Now, Clark, uh, I must see you at this time, and thank you so much for in here for the ESFL Fall Webinar Series. Fantastic. Thank you, Yael. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you fine. You sound very good. Continue on. Fantastic. Sounds good. I'll see if I can get... Oh, there we go. See if I can get a little web, uh, webcam possible so I can say hello to everybody. Uh, we are streaming live uh, from the home office here in Washington, D.C. of Students for Liberty. Uh, I'm very excited to be talking today on this topic. Uh, I'm going to be expanding a little bit on my thoughts uh, for my essay by the same name uh, in our recent book, Why Liberty. Uh, we're very excited by this project. Uh, we're really trying to find the voices uh, from our fellow young people uh, uh, to talk about uh, the major issues of today um, uh, and the major things of libertarianism uh, to speak to the fellow peers. Uh, so that a project of spreading liberty uh, is not just trying to get together academics and policy scholars uh, um, and our very friendly uh, allies who tend to be a bit older, uh, but really trying to focus on the work of young people uh, because it is our future that we're fighting for. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we want to make sure uh, that our voices are part of the conversation. Um, so with that, I'll just go ahead and jump into the presentation. Uh, we'll be doing Q&A at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the question box uh, on the webinar, um, uh, I guess, tool on the side of your screen. Uh, and then we will get to those at the end. Thank you. Uh, so libertarianism uh, as radical centrism. Let me get rolling with the slideshow. Go slideshow from the beginning. So. What do I mean here? There are a lot of terms in that um, uh, uh, that, uh, that have some baggage that needs to get unpacked uh, prior to having a conversation uh, for what this means for us as young libertarians. Uh, so let's just start out with the term libertarian itself, uh, try to unpack that a little bit. Uh, so what do I mean when I say libertarian? Um, libertarian is a word that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, there are many different philosophic justifications uh, for what libertarianism is and why it is uh, the right, best, uh, or most proper philosophy of politics. Uh, I think it's a good thing that there are many justifications for it, uh, and there are many different practical applications for what that means. Um, but when I think of libertarianism, I try to think of all of those various justifications kind of bundled together under uh, a broad libertarian umbrella. Uh, I like to use the term of my friend David Bowes of the Cato Institute. He likes to talk about the presumption of liberty. Uh, and that it is the exercise of power and not of freedom that requires justification. Uh, that's a good uh, broad umbrella principle that I think unites us all as libertarians. We think uh, people ought to be free, and if there is going to be a state, many of us argue that uh, there ought not be one, but if there is going to be one, uh, then the burden of proof is on them to argue why they need some power, uh, as opposed to being on us, uh, the people, to advocate for why we should have such freedom. Um, and uh, I think this is, as I said, uh, a strength of libertarianism. I think it means uh, that our movement and our philosophy is very diverse. I think it's great that you can be a personal cultural conservative or progressive. You can be urban or you can be rural. Um, uh, you can consume whatever you want, married, single, etc. You can live a bunch of different lifestyles. You can have a bunch of different backgrounds and a bunch of different views on the world. That's all fantastic. I really love the pluralism of liberty. Um, so I'm trying to frame this in a way uh, that is open and accessible to everyone. I want to talk a little bit about the kind of traditional political spectrum. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be arguing for where I think we fall on this spectrum, but I want to get out of the way because I'm talking to a generally libertarian audience uh, that 
we as libertarians know that the kind of traditional left-right model is bunk. Uh, it is a far oversimplified model to try to explain the world. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to anyone who gives some real concrete thought to it, who does not themselves have a team that falls neatly on it. Um, so um, it, is, it, it is itself very, uh, very suspect. Um, uh, the left-right spectrum tends to talk about the various ways uh, that one can distribute political power. However, we as libertarians, we go to the root. Uh, we question uh, the very use of that uh, power uh, as is. Um, so we really struggle with this left-right dichotomy, uh, and we openly fight against it. Uh, there, have been various art, uh, there have been various alternatives proposed to the left-right spectrum. Uh, there's a couple of them up on the screen there. They go from the diamonds, kind of uh, the standard libertarian Nolan chart, uh, where we very conveniently are on the top. Um, and then other various squares, uh, and hexagrams, and various things, various ways to try to put on paper, again, some kind of mental model to help simplify and explain the world, very complex phenomena. Um, I think they do uh, various, uh, uh, various roles in helping explain these things. They can be useful uh, in various contexts. But uh, one aspect of our job as young libertarians is to help communicate our ideas uh, to our peers. Uh, and there's a great uh, quote here from Saul Alinsky, uh, the great left-wing community organizer here from the United States, uh, who, really, uh, who really wrote the book um, on uh, a lot of what we do. Uh, and, it, um, uh, and this is a quote from his, uh, his book, Rules for Radicals. Uh, and he really focuses on communication. Uh, and, he sa uh, and he says that communication with others takes place when they understand what you're trying to get across to them. If they don't understand, then you're not communicating regardless of words, pictures, or anything else. People only understand things in terms of their experience. And that's something that I want to reemphasize to you, that it's fine for us as libertarians to tell people that the left-right spectrum is not accurate, it's unfair, et cetera, all these things. But unfortunately, that is the way in which most people are first introduced to politics, in in into this left-right spectrum. So yes, we should work to explain why that, that spectrum is too simplistic, but it's also very helpful for us as libertarians to be able to speak in terms of other people's uh, pre-existing experiences. So it's helpful for us to be able to talk in terms of the left-right spectrum uh, so that we can fit uh, what we're trying to get across uh, into uh, the way people already understand the world and try to give them a home on it. So what I envision uh, as libertarian as radical centrism is something more like this, something that while if, if, if you want to use uh, the kind of traditional left-right spectrum, uh, the we as libertarians, we fall uh, pretty generally in the middle. And from the middle, we project our ideas outward across the entire spectrum. We inform the best ideas of the left, the right, the center, everyone. The real, uh, the real agents of change, uh, the movements toward more freedom and toward more self-responsibility uh, into a freer uh, and more just world, it really all comes from our movement. Uh, and we should be proud of that. Uh, and so a few more things to say about what I think it means to be, to be a centrist. Uh, so to be radical centrist means to be radical in our analysis. Again, uh, radical comes from the Latin. It means we go to the root of the problem. Uh, so we're radical in our analysis. We are centrist in our application. Uh, we, we are both correct in a kind of idealist sense is that we, we, we think we're right, and we tend to be right on a lot of issues. Uh, but not just that, but we have practical common sense we, uh, common sense solutions for today's problems. And we can provide a reasonable alternative to the very broken status quo. Centrist beliefs. Most people hold generally libertarian beliefs in their day-to-day -day lives. This is a common theme of why liberty. Most people in their daily interactions are pretty libertarian. They don't steal other people's things. They don't try to impose the will upon others. They don't go breaking into somebody's house uh, because they have something they want. They don't go around trying to tell everybody what to do all the time. Uh, so they hold generally libertarian beliefs. And even when it comes to issues of public policy, uh, they tend to hold pretty libertarian beliefs. Uh, people generally believe in free speech and free expression. They believe in personal sovereignty and personal choice. They believe in fiscal and they believe in individual responsibility uh, and a restrained foreign policy. All these are kind of common sense beliefs. Uh, but while most uh, people kind of hold these ideas casually, we hold them dearly. We really take these things seriously, and that's one thing that we can really communicate to people, is that our beliefs are pretty common out there. We just think that there are you know, more logical steps people can take further down the road 
to see that the status quo is actually not embracing these things, that currently the government and the state is working against these things. Uh, and we want to work to get that back aligned um, uh, so that these uh, ideals become uh, real top priorities for everybody. Uh, and that uh, leads me to my next topic, uh, the absurdity of the status quo. Uh, it really helps to point out to people in your day-to-day -day conversations with them as you're trying to advance the ideas of liberty to step back from the kind of back and forth of the day-to-day -day political conversations and just to look at these, uh, these issues kind of on their own. And just think about it for a second. Which is the more extreme position? Saying that people should have personal choice about what they put into their own bodies, or that we should throw them in jail for smoking a plant? Sounds pretty absurd, right? Or that we should be practicing military restraint, or that we should be going around the world trying to police everybody and trying to play top dog all the time. Or that we should be responsible in our governmental spending, or that we should be running the printing presses uh, like, um, uh, like paper something. Uh, that's going out of style. Uh, most people would generally agree that, you know, in isolation, these things don't make a lot of sense. The current status quo is not working. It's not help. Uh, it's not helping make anybody's lives better. Uh, things like uh, uh, these never-ending wars and the war on drugs, uh, and just running the printing presses. Face values. Are, these sound like extreme measures. We've wound up there uh, through a long history uh, of errors and abuse of power by the government. Uh, so it's our job. Uh, as responsible citizens uh, as, um, and as young advocates of liberty to make sure that these issues are brought to the forefront. So while I say that we're centrist and while I say that most of the world runs on generally libertarian beliefs in a day-to-day -day manner, at the same time, it sure doesn't seem like it. The world isn't very libertarian on fa you know, out there, right? We're always talking about uh, the new state programs, the new abuses of power, et cetera. But at the same time, it's helpful to step back and to, again, realize that how we got to this point, how the modern uh, world runs on basically libertarian uh, premises. Um, and uh, here's a good quote here from our book, Why Liberty Again, uh, from the journalist Fareed Zakaria, which emphasizes that uh, we, uh, we as libertarians, we trace our history back to the classical liberal movement um, uh, of the 17th and 18th centuries. And we, for the most part, have won our major battles already. Uh, the major battles uh, that were confronting the classical liberals were things like separation of church and state, constitutionally limited government, uh, the abolition of slavery, free speech, free trade, and global capitalism. These are taken as a given for any modern political discourse. We've already won major victories on these fronts. And while it's obviously not per perfect today, the centrist positions of today are things that we brought to the table. We made these interests, uh, we made these issues centrist issues. Uh, it's important that you know we are proud of that, and we uh, and we make known to people. Uh, this is how we've gotten to the point we're at today. Again, uh, talking more about how we got to this point. Uh, if libertarianism is neither left nor right, as I argue, and if there is no overt libertarian political party then how have we achieved so much, uh, so much success uh, over the past few hundred years? And this is by working simultaneously on all sides of the political spectrum. Uh, as I said before, our ideas are powerful. From the center, we project our ideas outward, and we can work with both the left and right center all at the same time um, uh, to help move uh, the, windows, uh, the windows of political possibility. And I have a couple of case studies for how this has worked in the past and how it can continue to work in the future. So social change theory. Uh, we here at Students for Liberty uh, base our model of social change theory um, uh, on the work of many intellectuals, but specifically uh, on F.A. Hayek, uh, the Nobel laureate and libertarian theorist, uh, and particularly his essay uh, on the intellectuals and socialism, where he spends some time thinking about how it is that the socialists managed to take over power in large swaths of the world following on the achievements of the classical liberals and how they really co-opted the term liberal and took it over for their own. Uh, and he observed that it was, yes, there was, uh, these were political victories, uh, but what was uh, the most striking thing is that they were able to win uh, the intellectual battles. They, will, they were able to win uh, in the academy uh, and in the various policy conversations, and that they really were able to put together a very idealistic utopian vision for the future. 
where, yes, uh, the advances of capitalism uh, and of classical liberalism got us to a various point, but now it's going to take socialism and Marxism to take us to the next step uh, and to be able to reach a utopian future. Uh, and Hayek argues that uh, that's the battle that confronts us today, is that we have to go about uh, re-winning that battle of ideas. Uh, if we can't recapture uh, that moral and that intellectual high ground, uh, then our battle is going to be for naught. Because the politicians are generally lagging indicators. They tend to follow public opinion, and public opinion is made uh, not so much by the kind of ivory tower intellectuals up in the academy. They're very important. We need to work on that. But what he focuses is, uh, is on the second-hand dealers in ideas. Maybe not those coming up with the theories themselves, but those who go about spreading them. Uh, your various community leaders and your business leaders and your church leaders uh, and your journalists and your pundits and those people, the people who really are themselves multipliers of ideas, those are the people that we need to be focusing on. We need to be working uh, to create more of those uh, so that we can have a trickle-down effect in society. We can influence public opinion, and from there, uh, the politicians will follow. Um, one of my kind of prime examples for our role as radical centrists in this uh, process of social change, uh, and, and, uh, and very specifically uh, as young people and students in it, uh, is looking back to the 1960s uh, and uh, the various radical student movements in the United States, which have since then gone on uh, to, shape, uh, to shape the discourse of a public debate ever since. On the left, uh, you had an organization called Students for a Democratic Society, and on the right, you had Young Americans for Freedom. Now, neither one of these were very uh, openly or overtly libertarian, uh, but they were both very strongly influenced by libertarianism uh, and, uh, and uh, had strong libertarians in their ranks. On the right, uh, you had Young Americans for Freedom. Uh, their founding document, the Sharon Statement, which was adopted in 1960, uh, makes some very libertarian claims. You can see some of them there on the screen for you. Uh, their hero uh, was very libertarian Republican Senator Barry Goldwater. Uh, uh, and in his 1964 presidential campaign, uh, in his address to the nation, uh, you know, he made some very libertarian comments to the extent that he would remind you that extremism in defense of liberty is no vice, uh, and that moderation uh, in pursuit of justice is no virtue. Uh, obviously very libertarian sentiments. Then on the left, uh, you had students for a democratic society. Uh, people tend to know more about uh, the libertarian history of YAF um, I, I've been doing research lately uh, on the libertarian history in SES, and it's there and it is strong. It's something I would like to make more known uh, throughout our movement. Uh, their founding document was the Port Huron Statement, which was adopted in 1962. Also, uh, has very libertarian themes, uh, which you can read there on the screen. Uh, I strongly advise anybody who has not read the Port Huron Statement to go ahead and download it online. It's available free to read it. Um, one of the most important documents for us as youth organizers had a profound effect uh, and a very motivating effect uh, on the generation. Uh, it's still mentioned and referenced in pop culture today, um, uh, and it still has a lasting influence. Um, probably one of the most important documents uh, in our recent modern history uh, as young student advocates for liberty. Uh, and in 1965, the president uh, of SDS, Carl Oglesby, uh, was very openly uh, a libertarian, and he openly identified as, uh, as himself as a radical centrist. Uh, he was making the argument that uh, the advantage of libertarianism is that it stands that allows us to speak both to the right and to the left. Because we share common ground with both sides, we can speak to people in their experiences. We can explain to them uh, how, uh, how the state, the government, uh, is not their ally, how most of the problems that they're fighting against are creations of the state, and that we need to work together to roll back the powers of the government and to hold those in power accountable to us. Uh, uh, and Carl, Ope, uh, he argued very openly that you make a much stronger case, uh, in his case he was speaking against uh, the war in Vietnam, but generally, that you make a strong case of the war that you could show both the left and the right oppose it. Uh, and that, you know, in his strategizing uh, how students for democratic society was going to go about achieving this, that they were going to build a broad coalition that was able to reach out to centrists and conservatives. They weren't going to reach out further to the left, but they were going to uh, take this libertarian, radical centrist approach to build their coalition, and that's what they did. Uh, and the anti-war movement here in the United States and elsewhere and abroad across the world became one of both the left, the right, and the center 
uh, and everybody working together uh, to argue uh, uh, against the wars of expansion and empire. Um, and you saw uh, a rather radical winding back uh, of those expansionist wars. Unfortunately, uh, until the turn of this century uh, and the rise of the neocons and the U.S. government um, uh, and the re-engaging of the wars of empire abroad. So some more advantages to us identifying as being radically centrist. Uh, to be radically centrist is to be transpartisan. Again, it gives us the great strength of being able to reach out to both the right and the left. To, to say that uh, the, on, on the flip side, others argue that we should you know, place libertarianism on the right of the spectrum so that we can work with conservatives to, to advance our common goals. And while I might agree that there are many common goals uh, to be advanced there, uh, as libertarians, we know that all of our actions uh, have various opportunity costs. Uh, and the opportunity cost of allying strongly with the right is that it closes us off to being able to work with our allies, uh, or our very strong potential allies on the left, because they see us with skepticism. If we say, hey, we're coming for the right, listen to us, nobody's going to listen to you again. You have to talk to people in terms they understand. And if we wall ourselves up on either side, left or right, and that just cuts us off uh, from our potential allies on the other side. And we as libertarians, being nonpartisan, being transpartisan, allows us to be that central focal point uh, to get the left and the right, you know, working together with us and working together with each other when there are just widespread abuses of power that we all need to be opposing. Uh, here, uh, a good recent example uh, is the recent government shutdown in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of political absurdity going on, a lot of political theater, a lot of political grandstanding, uh, lots of brinksmanship. A lot of people were frustrated and pissed off at everybody, all parties involved. And we as libertarians, because we didn't really have a stake in the fight, were able to stand back and say, this is all absurd and stupid. Both these sides are acting like petulant little children, and, we, when, and, and we're not going to stand for it. Uh, the nation has bigger problems. We as individuals have bigger problems we need to be working on. Also, the advantage of being centrist is that we do not inherit the baggage of either the two wings of the political spectrum. We don't inherit the racism, the xenophobia, the corruption, all the things that both progressives and conservatives have been saddled by over the past decades. We can be free of all that because, again, we don't, we don't, have, to, um, we don't have to be pulled down uh, by this baggage on either side of the political spectrum. And, we, uh, and to be radical centrist also uh, has universal application. Uh, and it has global context. Uh, the left and right spectrum will have various specifics based on what country you're in. Which people and which groups and which parties occupy either side of the spectrum is going to vary from country to country. So we don't, as a broad, global, diverse student movement for liberty, we don't want to be pigeonholed on either side because we want to be able to speak in the same language you know, all across the world. And by being radically centrist, it allows us to speak in language that will resonate across countries and across cultures. No matter what, being in the centrist, moderate, reasonable position in the center uh, has broad appeal to everybody. And again, we can talk about how we have ideas, but we also have solutions that can make people's lives better now. Uh, we can reduce uh, the burden of government. We can make people more free. Uh, we can give them more security and the property and the person, no matter where they are. We can end the wars, uh, and we can give people real tangible benefits now. So the kind of what now? You know, where do we go from here? I talked a bit about the history, about the 1960s and 70s, um, you know, even going back further to the classical liberal movements. So that kind of gets us to a point today. We have seen various swings back uh, to government power, and now uh, we, see, uh, we see many of the crises of government uh, happening all around us. Uh, the various fiscal crises in Europe and the United States, uh, the soon-to-be monetary crises uh, that are probably coming down the pipe, Probably more wars on the horizon. There are a lot of challenges for us as young advocates of liberty, but the future is always uh, the future is also very bright, in the sense of these failings of government give us lots of opportunities. Uh, young people are seeing the failure of government, the failure of the status quo. Uh, they're fed up with it, and they're looking for alternatives. And here we are as libertarians, saying, "Hey, we've been saying this for decades. Now people are finally starting to listen to us and starting to pay attention. We predicted many of these problems." and that we have solutions for how we can go about fixing it. So I think by employing uh, our Hayekian theories of social change, combining them with uh, this radical centrist approach, we can have broad appeal and continue to reach out to new audiences, both left, right, and center, with our message 
to show them that we have steps forward that we can take uh, to fix the various problems that the government has caused. Uh, so how are we doing that at Students for Liberty? Again, we're fighting the battle of ideas. Uh, our theory of social change is based on empowerment, by empowering students to be, angel, uh, to be agents of change in their communities. Uh, we are working uh, to build broad coalitions, to build relationships and partnerships with both the left and the right. Uh, we are going to be co-sponsors of a rally this Saturday in Washington, D.C., uh, the Stop Watching Us Coalition, a uh, partnership of both organizations from the left, right, and center. Uh, united against uh, the NSA and the surveillance state, uh, uh, and uh, we're very uh, and we're very excited for that event. And you know that's just one example uh, for how we, we can find allies uh, on, on both the left and the right. There's other issues, uh, you know, um, issues ranging from gun rights uh, to ending the war on drugs. Uh, that's an issue where we find a lot of allies on the left. Uh, we work with the left on al uh, uh, working together uh, of issues of marriage equality, uh, on privacy, uh, on ending the wars, on ending the use of drones and warfare. Uh, there are lots of opportunities for building these coalitions, and we can find willing partners. We're going to find a lot of skeptical people too. That's to be expected. You should expect people in new communities you're trying to reach out to to be skeptical of your approach. But you need to come to them uh, with open arms. You need to speak to them in terms they understand. Explain to them that we might share a lot of differences for our means, for how we go about uh, achieving a more just, free world. But generally, we share, this, uh, we share the same end goals. We, we all commonly want uh, a future of prosperity, freedom, openness, and toleration. Uh, we want to make sure that we're advancing those ideas together and working toward those common goals, uh, and that together we have more strength uh, than separately. And yes, we have our differences, and we should be talking about those and having dialogues and conversations on those. And it's important to just have those open conversations, but we still should be working together on these issues with, uh, on which we agree, because real people are suffering right now. People are being spied on. I, our civil liberties are eroding. Uh, communities are being destroyed by the war on drugs. And also on the right, all this massive government spending, all this debt is going to cripple future generations. We need to work on these issues now together uh, to be able to ensure a more free libertarian future. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, uh, kind of a broad overview of what I think uh, libertarianism uh, as radical centrism means, how it can be an effective tool for us, not just understanding our own role in the world, but communicating that role uh, to the people we're working with, uh, and I think helps sets us up in a very strong position uh, to occupy uh, the radical center uh, as the various uh, states become higher, especially here in the United States, uh, as we continue to try to sustain this global empire, uh, the stakes of holding power become higher. The various parties uh, kind of coalesce on their end to try to hold on to power. And a lot of the regular people are, are start watching this thinking this is absurd. And we can come in and say, look, this is absurd. We need to stop this. Um, we have explanations, though, for why this is happening. Uh, and we want to, to work with both sides to help rein in uh, all these abuses of power uh, on both sides of the spectrum. Um, so with that, I will move to Q&A. If anybody has any questions, I can answer. Well, thank you so much, Clark. Uh, you are a man of passion and rigor, and I really enjoyed listening to that, and I know uh, everyone else did as well. So. If there are any questions, obviously I cannot see them at the moment, but uh, if the, the backroom chatter there at the office can, can tune in and see hands raised or questions asked, then we shall try to answer them. I actually also cannot see the question box at the moment. Um, one moment. Well, to the rest of you who are still on the line, we have a great webinar set up for next week. It will feature Mr. Jeffrey Tucker and Max Borders. 
They'll be giving their presentation on 50 ways to leave Leviathan. It's actually a pretty handy list. There's a good uh, link you can foundation for economic education, uh, fee.org. You can find that. I believe that is included within the invitation that I went out. So please do go to studentsforliberty.org slash Europe, or you can go to esfl.info, and you'll see webinar series there. You can just click, 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 and there you shall find next week's webinar, also Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central European. Great. Thank you, Yael. Uh, I got the questions up and running now. Got a question here uh, on uh, the, uh, the oversimplification of the spectrum uh, from, from Giles, uh, which is, uh, he says he missed the first few minutes, but I will review it uh, because, again, I think this is an important point. Uh, and yes, uh, to, to reiterate, uh, the left-right model is pretty stupid. Um, it does not uh, encapsulate uh, the full extent of what uh, the political realm looks like. Uh, it should have many axes if it is going to. Um, but again, these things are generally mental models that people try to sim put simplified things on paper to help people understand a complex world. Um, and I think no matter what version you're looking at, they all have their various flaws. Um, so I think we as libertarians on our end have to understand that, yes, these things are flawed. And these are very good conversations to have with people in the context of a student group meeting or out for beers afterwards or something to that extent. Uh, those are all very good conversations to have about, about you know, what uh, a you know, proper spectrum looks uh, like and why the left-right model is so vastly oversimplified. Uh, but again, that brings me to my point about communication and just the importance of communicating to people in terms they already understand. If you're just meeting a student for the first time on campus, and you know you're handing out books or literature, or you know, or, or something to that extent, and you know, it's it, it's totally fair for a student to ask you, well, okay, you're a libertarian. I don't really know what that is. Where do you fall on the political spectrum? Because that's the that's just what the context in which they understand politics ahead of time. Um, and you can't. You could go to them and say, "Well, the political spectrum is bunk, and it doesn't make any sense, and it's oversimplified." And that might work on some people, but for many people, they're just going to ignore you or tune you out because they don't know what you're talking about already. So I think it's helpful for us as libertarians to be able to speak in the context of the left-right spectrum because that is the way in which most people understand the world, uh, at least from a very introductory level of politics. So be able to have those conversations with the new freshmen and sophomores on campus. Again, I don't think uh, that radical centrism in and of itself, you know, is 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 entirely accurate in the sense of in, uh, in the sense of encapsulating uh, all of libertarianism and theory and practice, uh, because it is very broad and very diverse, and there's a lot to it. But I think it is a useful mental model, especially to use both in our own framing of where we fit within, you know, the rest of the world, which does break itself down in these left-right divides, um, and in ways of communicating to people who are new to the idea. Uh, next question is, why do you think the right has been more of an ally than the left in the past years? Um, there are various uh, historical reasons why this is the case. Um, you can trace back to uh, the, uh, the success uh, of the socialists um, in the, the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, building on the success of, again, the classical liberals, uh, our forebearers in the intellectual tradition. Um, they, they, they took up a lot of their momentum because the classical liberals, to be honest, got a little soft. They won a lot of their battles. Uh, they ended slavery. They had free speech. They had democracy. Uh, they broke down the ancient power orders. Uh, lots of accomplishments and not a whole lot of, uh, I, I guess, new ideas. The movement kind of ran out of intellectual rigor uh, and new challenges to overcome. Uh, became somewhat complacent. So the socialists came in uh, to that gap, and they came in with a new idealistic vision, and they identified real problems, uh, some unintended consequences uh, of the Industrial Revolution, of capitalism, other systems that we as classical liberals were defending. They put it out there that there was real harm being done to real people, and that people were falling through the cracks, and that you know these working conditions in factories were pretty awful. And while these conditions might have been better uh, than what had existed beforehand, the socialists argued that they could uh, that they could be better still. Uh, so the socialists took up the, the the banner of change, the banner of liberalism, 
um, the banner of the ones arguing for more idealistic future. Uh, and they, they occupy what is now kind of traditionally thought of as the left, the left side of the political spectrum, when previously you could have argued uh, that, that, that that side was occupied by libertarians. Um, and uh, so uh, as the classical liberal movement uh, uh, wiltered, um, uh, the left gained strength. Uh, the right kind of grew up in reactionary opposition to that. And the libertarians, tried even that being a word, were kind of lost in the wilderness for a while. Um, it wasn't until the end of World War II um, uh, that Hayek organizes uh, the first meeting of the Mon Pelerin Society, starts getting together the last two remaining classical liberal intellectuals uh, to try to rebuild this movement. And that's been the project that we've been a part of ever since. Um, and early on, there just weren't very many of us. And the, the real challenge of socialism uh, was their, uh, their critique and challenge against capitalism, uh, against uh, the market order, uh, challenge against private property. And that was one of the primary challenges that, that one of the primary challenges um, uh, that we as libertarians needed to overcome. Uh, so we found allies on the right. Uh, people who were uh, who, who were also pro markets, uh, and we we allied with them. Um, there's another lecture that I give. You can find other essays online uh, on the history of fusionism here in the United States. Fusionism being the formal alliance between the libertarians um, and the conservatives that was created in the early uh, in late 50s and early 1960s. Um, if you go to our website, I on I have more commentary on the history of that if you're more interested in it uh, and how exactly. Exactly, we got to this point, uh, but I would argue that you've seen uh, the Fusionist Alliance breaking down uh, here in the United States um, over the past the past 20 or so years, uh, largely because the conservatives got power uh, and then proved that they weren't actually all that committed to these ideals in the first place. Um, and so, I not, so now I think there's an opportunity for us as libertarians uh, to again move away from that kind of right-wing fusionist uh, mold and move you know back toward the center. Uh, and reestablish ourselves as something that can work with both the right and the left. Uh, next question. Uh, there are many different definitions of the left and the right in different countries. Uh, so how can we see libertarianism as radical centrism? Um, give me one moment on this. I need to change something on the webinar uh, system. And uh, there you go. So as I said, um, I think the advantage to, to identifying as centrist or just speak in terms of centrism uh, has, has strong advantages uh, specifically because uh, of that, um, of the fact that the, what, what is associated with the left and the right varies from country to country. Uh, while the political center tends to be the place where kind of the moderate-minded, common-sense people tend to hang out. And if we can position ourselves there, that puts us in a position to be able to talk to those people directly uh, and to be able to show them that, again, many of the problems facing the world today are not creations of the market or of capitalism or of freedom, but these are challenges of government. These are problems the government has created, and then they go about saying that they need to fix all the problems. You need to give them more power to fix the problems they made. Um, so I think, again, being able to identify as centrist allows us to speak from country to country in common language and in common parlance um, so that we can have a kind of universal message. We don't have to necessarily you know, reinvent the wheel every time we talk to somebody from a different country about what we're trying to accomplish. And again, hold on for just one moment. Get the next question queued up. We seem to have a very chatty audience. Also, since I do have the floor, we did just have two great regional conferences in Sofia and Stockholm, so you can go to our website. Again, that's um, esfl.info, or you can also go to studentsforliberty.org slash Europe. You'll see some write-ups, some pictures, 
and pictures of great people having great times. And we have many more regional conferences to come if you're in any of the areas. Those are also available on the website. And I will hand it back over to Clark, who is ready and willing to answer your questions if you still have them. Great. Thank you very much again, Yael. Much appreciated. Um, so next question, uh, couldn't we call libertarianism the progressive right? Um, interesting terminology. Um, uh, I suppose we, we very well could. Um, again, there's a you know, lot of baggage in both of those terms that we would need to unpack what exactly it means to be progressive. Um, what the progressives themselves think as is you know, probably different than what we do. Um, uh, and again, if you want to think about the absurdity of kind of uh, these various political spectrum models, to, to picture this thing as something that kind of curves around back into itself and the left meets the right on the extremes, um, you know, as people argue sometimes, that also doesn't make a lot of sense. Again, where does freedom fit into it then in that, you know, uh, in that regard? Um, you know, if you have various forms of totalitarianism on either end, that also seems pretty absurd. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of different ways we can talk about it. Um, you know, I, I like ways that don't really pigeonhole us onto one side or another. Um, uh, I, I would like to say that I think that we as libertarians are progressive. I think that we do want to move forward to a better future. But the cool thing about our, our philosophy and kind of the distinction that the classical liberals made uh, from the progressives is that the progressives very clearly, you know, have, have their end in mind, right? Like they know what the ideal future is and they just need to get everybody on board and move toward it together. We as libertarians, though, take a slightly different view of how this works. We want to improve the world as well. But we tend to focus more on uh, improvement, um, that we can make the world a better place, more piecemeal in small little pieces. We can find more freedoms. We can get more freedom uh, you know, um, on various issues. And we can create a, a, a construct, a context, in which people can define for themselves what their ideal world is. Um, something uh, that the libertarian philosopher Robert Nozick uh, said that libertarianism is not itself utopia, but it is a framework for utopias. We can create a free and open world, then individuals can choose for themselves what their, you know, what their ideal world within that broader context is. Um, so in that sense, uh, the progressives probably would object to us using their terminology so on your own, if you want to use that kind of terminology because you think it might be effective in communicating with people uh, on your campus or in your school, then you know I would encourage uh, you know more experimentation, you know, with more terminology that can that can you know help explain to people where we're coming from, uh, you know, and how you know how we envision making the world a better place. Um, and that's all the questions I have for now, y'all. Anybody have any more? Nope. Oh, wait. There is one more. Oh, a few more. So a question about the difference in terminology between the United States and Europe and the use of the word liberal um, uh, and the use of the word libertarian. Is there actually a difference? of uh, the meanings between Europe and the USA? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that, though. Um, uh, as again, many of these issues are. Because again, the, intro, uh, the intellectual history of our movement, um, again, the, the classical liberals uh, were, were uh, you know, the liberals and the progressives of their day, those who were really fighting against the status quo, really fighting for a change and for a more open society and things like that. Um, now, in the United States, you saw, you know, the same the same kind of people. The classical liberals uh, were co-opted co in a sense by the progressives. Uh, the progressive movement took up the terminology uh, of the liberals um, uh, here in the United States, uh, so that uh, today uh, liberal is more commonly associated with the left uh, than with libertarianism, which I think is very unfortunate because I think the term liberal is honestly exactly what we are. I think liberalism, in terms of openness and toleration, uh, a toleration for various lifestyles and different beliefs and pluralism, uh, all these things, really, uh, really encompassed by the term liberal. It's a term that I would love to be able to fight to get back. 
And fortunately, it seems like many progressives here in the states are abandoning the term uh, and they're going back to using progressive more openly and honestly, which I appreciate because it just is them being more honest about what they actually are. Um, meanwhile, in some European countries, uh, the term liberal is still used more in the classical sense. Um, usually not in a strictly libertarian sense, usually more in a uh, kind of soft and moderate liberal sense, but generally I will take that and we tend to find strong allies in our work at Students for Liberty, working with various liberal uh, student groups and various liberal political organizations. We can find a lot of allies there. Um, again, they tend to be more political and focus on the various political um, you know, and the more partisan aspects, but again, we can find strong allies there. Uh, and we have over time, and we hope to continue to do so. Um, and, but again, there are some other countries where the term liberal has just faded out of all parlance and usage altogether. Um, so it kind of depends country to country. Um, but uh, again, because these terms are so so uh, so varied, uh, and they all carry a lot of baggage with them. Again, another reason I like radical centrist um, because it, it it doesn't carry with it as much of that baggage. We can kind of set the terms as we want to is we don't have to go and try to explain away all these preconceptions people might have about what these various things mean. Yet enough answered question there, Clark. How many more do you have in the queue? That's it. All right. Well, I do have to thank you again, Clark, and thank you everyone for tuning in, for listening. We're going to have another one next week, and if you are interested in more of these ideas and more of what's going on, in Why Liberty and why you should be a proponent of radical centrism, please pick up Why Liberty. Either go to our website and look up for the ESFL Why Liberty book order forms. We can send this to your student group ASAP. Or you can also uh, go to our website or Facebook page, and we'll be propagating this message all week long. Check out next week's webinar and uh, reporting for Pisoski. So we go. Thank you again, Clark. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Much appreciated. If you have any questions, feel free to follow up with me. My email address is cruper, C-R-U-P-E-R, -E and that's at studentsforliberty.org. After talk with anybody about these various topics or anything in Why Liberty or anything else connected to the libertarian youth movement. So thank you very much, everybody, and, keep out the, uh, and please keep up the good work out there. It is all greatly appreciated. The organizer